Aloha, and welcome back to Politics and Land in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Judge Bill Fernandez from Kapa'a, Kauai. He attended Kamehameha School and Stanford University. He is a former Superior Court judge and mayor in Sunnyville, California. Understand that it's twice the size of Kauai. He was also the director of the county water commission and served on the city council there. He was also in the Air Force Reserve. He has written many books telling stories of old Kapa town and Hawaiian history as well as novels. He has returned to his hometown with his wife Judith and can often be seen walking the Kapa bike path by Fuji Beach with friends Delit Ball and Caroline Miro. Bill, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha konui la, Dennis. Mahalo. Yeah. Bill, please tell us a little more about your background, starting from small kid time in Kapaa. Well, I was a barefoot boy. I didn't know much. Uh, I, it really was, uh, you know, we didn't have much money when I was growing up. You had to make everything you wanted to play with. Uh, I love to tell the tin canoe story where you get old uh, sheet metal and you had it, uh, uh, the, the wrinkles all taken out. And then you put, you, you curved it up like you would a half a tin can and you put a prow and a bow, you know, a wooden prow, wooden bow. And then you went out into the ocean with your uh, tin can. And that's a real adventure when you're trying to deal with waves on a, on a uh, sitting on a tin can without a keel, keel uh, and then paddling yeah. it along. But that's, a, that's the way we lived. Uh, we, had, we made everything we uh, played with when I was a child. And, uh, and uh, all of us, all of the guys I knew we did a little fishing. You always have to either spear manini or in a layer uh, and get something to eat. So uh, that, was the, that was the early life uh, that we led. Things have changed quite a bit. Yeah, uh, as a little kid, I did uh, uh, much of the same things. Little kid growing up in Alimanu, uh, then I moved to Kapal Homestead. I used to go to Roxy Theater to watch Japanese movies once in a while with my grandpa. Kung Fu. Kung yeah. Fu. <laughs> <laughs> I, also, I also went to the dentist there, but I did not know much of the interesting history. Can you tell us a little bit about the Roxy Kiara story? Well, the, uh, my father was a, uh, a showman. He would uh, travel around the different islands and he would show his movies. He, he, he kind of rent a hall or he, he'd pitch a tent and he would show his movies to the, in very plantation towns. And he always wanted to have his own movie theater. And uh, back then, uh, and I'm talking about the 1930s, uh, you, the, all the land was controlled by the plantations. So in order for my father to buy a plot of ground on the town of Kapa, he had to see the great white father uh, to get permission to buy a, an acre of land for $10,000 and had to promise that he would uh, show wholesome movies. So he acquired the land in 1936, and it took him about two years to plan his uh, theater, two and a half years, really. And uh, the Roxy Theater opened in uh, 1939, uh, and it was state-of-the-art, 1,100 seats. but. You know, Kauai was a small place, uh, you know, 30,000 people for the whole island, and you really couldn't fill a 1,100-seat theater. It was, it was, again, state-of-the-art, beautiful screen, great stereo sound. However, by uh, June, of, June, July 1941, my father said, I'm going bankrupt. He can't pay the uh, mortgage on the, the theater, which was... $40,000. Uh, so we were going to lose everything we had. 
and uh, uh, fortunate, un unfortunately, the war came along, but it was also fortunate in the sense that martial law was imposed and there was no civil court, so you couldn't have any civil proceedings. And what really saved the Roxy Theater was the fact that there would be some, a whole division of troops from New York, the Fighting 69th, that was the regiment of the Rainbow Division, was, was in, uh, 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 set in uh, Kapa and behind the uh, Sipi Giant Mo Mountain. And when the uh, martial law relieved the use of civilian facilities like movie theaters, uh, shops, um, bars, uh, we were able to open the doors to all the servicemen. And before you know it, the most popular place in town was the Roxy Theater. You would have 1,100 people there every Saturday and Sunday watching the movies. Most of them were GIs. So it saved my father from uh, losing the theater and kind of uh, uh, help, helped us, my, my mother, sister and I, to finally get an education. Could never have gone to Stanford without the uh, Roxy Theater. Yeah, well, you mentioned the uh, they had the military in the back of Sleeping Giant. You know where exactly it was? Well, it was a, it was way back up towards uh, Waiale Ali Mountain. Oh, uh, uh, so that's where they housed about. Uh, they had about fifteen thousand uh, soldiers there uh, in jungle training. They were being trained for uh, jungle warfare primarily in the Philippines, but I think New Guinea was a factor in, in, the, in that training that they, that, that they went through. So, so we it, were very much controlled by the military and during the uh, Second World War. Yeah, that yeah, was a little bit before my time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know, you weren't even born yet. You yeah, didn't know yeah. that there was barbed wire. You didn't know <laughs> there was barbed wire along all the beaches on Kauai. Yeah, you couldn't one, go out fishing. Yeah, one of my uh, uncles was in the Bob Wire gang that much uh, that most people on the island don't know about Bob Wire gang. Um, so you mentioned the Rainbow Division. Division. Is that, yeah, is that uh, uh, what you call it? Rainbows over Kapa? You had a book? No, 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 no. <laughs> Rainbows over Kapa is, does not have to do with the division. Uh, the idea of rainbows is this. Kapa Town was really, uh, because of the war, was a gold mine for lots of what you call lower middle class businesses, like my father. My father was lower middle class business. And then uh, there were others like George Kondo's uh, uh, Coca Cola shop. And I, and I can name other, uh, a few others, but we were able to profit from the war. And that's why when I wrote the book, Rainbows Over Kapa'a, you know, before the war, you struggled. You really did to make a living. But when the war came and you had a lot of money coming into the islands, people had money to deal with. And so, it's uh, like finding a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow to have uh, had a, uh, a, a successful business in Kapa'a town because of, again, because of the war. So you, you got, uh, you're like you, you got rainbows of Kapa'a and some other books. Can you tell us uh, what are the, some of the other books, like Kauai Kid. What well, Kauai Kid, Kids tells you the story of how us young people grew up. Now, you have to remember, uh, Dennis, you may have not have been alive at the time, but Kauai was surrounded uh, by sugarcane fields. 
and then there was a pineapple fields so that there were many places you couldn't go that were uh, what they call kapu, uh, don't enter. And, uh, you know, the in interesting thing about the plantations is they didn't care ab about the people. I mean, uh, I don't know if, if you ever re remember the time when there was Sabidong signs, yep. they, would they would spray the cane fields uh, with DDT. So uh, anyway, I'm uh, straying a little bit from the story, but it's it's important to know that we were very confined as uh, children. We were confined to the beach, and we maybe uh, were confined to the streams that might have gone by where uh, near where we lived. But the cane fields, you were, you it was sabedong, you know, poisonous. You stayed out of it. So. Uh, from my standpoint, when you look at Kauai kids and the picture of the ocean, this is a place where we live out here in the sea uh, uh, during my time growing up. Uh, and, the, and, and the people uh, who lived on Kauai, again, had to deal with the plantation restrictions as to where we could go uh, from, you know, either for holo holo, meaning go, go around someplace for a holiday or, or uh, where we could um, uh, be safe. So, and the safest place was the ocean which was taken away from us by the war because they put barbed wire along all of the beaches. Yeah, well, I was uh, born in 1951, so I missed the war, but um, that was my uh, dad's time. He went to college, studied sugar technology to work in the plantation, but due to uh, uh, discrimination, uh, he left and farmed on his own. So we live, you know, close to the beach. We ate manini, nenui, and uh, for our meals. Yeah. yeah, you know all about that. Yeah, I know all about that, my uh, Dennis. Yeah, I mean th things didn't change that much after the yeah. war, but you, we were still in a plantation economy. Yeah, at the time. Uh, yeah, at that time they had uh, some places had pineapples and still had sugar cane. Um, there was a whole different. Uh, Era, yeah. Um, so, or some other books you got? You had one about uh, uh, King Kamehameha and the splintered paddle. Can you tell us about that story? Well, I, I have uh, several books about Kamehameha. Uh, the, the first one is Splintered Paddle, which tells the story of the beginning of his conquest of the islands. He, he was really on the big island of Hawaii where he uh, tried for eight years, by the way, he tried uh, with, with, you know, wood spears and bone, bone uh, uh, clubs and uh, shark teeth to uh, try to uh, try to win the island. But until the Howleys brought guns. He couldn't make a headway. I mean, I mean and I'm talking about eight years. And, and so Spinner Paddle tells you the story of how he finally uh, conquered uh, Hawaii Island and his many battles uh, in that uh, in, on that island and also on the island of Maui, because he was uh, he was into the conquest approach. So he, he did uh, conquer Maui and then he lost Maui and he was back in Hawaii Island. So that that is a splendid paddle when he finally took control of Hawaii Island. And then the next one is a Conquest, which tells the story of how he finally conquered every island but Ni Hao. And if you see the picture of the book Conquest in the front cover, 
we show you the sort of the end game, the battle of Nuuanu, where King Kamehameha, the conqueror of the islands, became a famous hero one day. He fought a native army and he pushed them over the poly and said, Awe Anohie, Awe Anohie, goodbye, farewell. <laughs> and then uh, they found all, uh, when they built the new Pali Howie, they found all these hundreds and hundreds of skeletons of soldiers that had been pushed over uh, the, the cliffs and died. So that is uh, conquest. And then the follow up book is um, End of the Gods, which tells the story where after Kamehameha passes away, where Kahumanu, a woman, said, I am so angry at being told I can't go to the temple and, and uh, meet with the other chiefs. I'm so angry because I, I'm restricted in the food I can eat. I'm so angry because I can't sleep where the men sleep. So she fostered a, a revolution with help and brought down what's called the kapu system, a bunch of no-no rules that could be made on a spur of the moment by a chief or a priest. Kapu means no-no. And you break a kapu rule, you die. So, I mean, that's the story. Uh, that's the, I'll, I'll call it sort of the end of the Kamehameha story because it, because uh, the kapu system was so much a part of the control system of the Hawaiians. But I love to tell stories about the past so people can understand how we, uh, Hawaiians had to overcome a lot of uh, difficulties as uh, native people. And I, I don't know if people uh, are into, you know, reading about revolutions, but, uh, uh, Revolutions have changed the life of a lot of people. America is one example, and there are others. I'm just reading a book about Cuba and the 1956 revolution in Cuba that freed the people, people of Cubans from the capitalism of America. So anyway, I diverted a little bit from what you're asking. So what about the splintered paddle? Well, splintered paddle, I told you a little earlier, is about how Kamehameha you know, conquered uh, the island of uh, Hawaii. And, and the reason I chose splintered paddle is because Kamehameha, at, uh, when he was going through his attempts to win the island, saw a bunch of fishermen on the shore. So he wanted to grab their fish. But then he got his foot stuck in the coral and the fisherman said, okay, you were going to kill us. Well, we're going to get you. And he pounded his head with a paddle and it splintered. And the, the reason I felt that that was it, to talk about it was Kamehameha learned a big lesson from it because later on he came up with a law, which is the primary law in Hawaii. You must take care of the old. You must take care of the people that are helpless and allow them to sleep and live in peace. That, that's a, a law of, from Kamehameha back in uh, 17, um, I'm trying to remember exactly, about 1775, 76. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's a primary law in Hawaii. So anyway, you know, I bring out these stories because <laughs> that, it, it has a lot of relevance to what's going on in Hawaii. That that, that was Judith Fernandez, uh, <laughs> Bill, 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 Bill's boss. Um, yeah, there's a, uh, you got a book on the Anapepe massacre also on the island of Kauai. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's uh, terrorism in paradise, and I, and I think you know this is the book, terrorism in paradise, and the, the, you have to understand. All of us have to understand that when you were living here, even in the 1930s, and in the 1920s, 
and even earlier, we were strictly under the control of a plantation economy and a plantation power structure. And that power structure, which is a minority of the people, controlled the entire islands. The plantations brought in different relate, uh, races to work in the plant, uh, plantation fields. Now, this might be interesting to the Japanese because uh, the the Japanese people were a little smarter than the Hawaiians, I have to say, because they started to say, you know, we, we need to have better wages. We need to have better working conditions. And let's talk about that. When you were working in the plantations, you, you, you didn't really have a living wage and you worked six days a week, sometimes 12 hours a day. Okay. So the, the Japanese um, had a strike in 1920 and it was a six month strike and it really hurt uh, the plantation. So they brought in Filipinos there that were to, to be strike breakers. All right, now uh, the, they settled that strike and uh, Malapit who was the union leader of the Filipinos. And by the way, let's talk about those people first. The plantations were really canny, very smart. They brought in illiterates, people, the workers who did not know how to read or to write. And Malapit kind of lied and he, he got on the boat and came here, but he was an attorney and he was a so he became a union leader for the Filipinos. So now he says, okay, let's go, let's go strike. What did they want? $2 a month more and an eight hour day. Plantation said, no way, we're going to bring in uh, Visayan. Okay, you have to remember that in the Philippines, it was tribal. You had Ilocanos, Visayans, and other, other people. The first Filipinos here were Ilocano. Now you bring in Visayan in the 20s to be strike breakers. So what happened was two Visayan young men were walking into Hanapepe town, I believe to get some shoes. And the, uh, the strike breakers who were Ilicano, they'd been out for about six months. And you understand, they were trying to get a couple of dollars a month more and eight hour a day. Uh, the the, the Ilicanos, you know, could grab those two Visayan boys and held them. Uh, the, the, the sheriff was uh, told about that. So they came over, uh, Kroll, Sheriff Kroll came over to the schoolhouse where they, where the, everybody was um, confined. And he says, you gotta release these kids to me. No, 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 said the strike breakers. So what he does, he goes back and he gets a warrant and he gets the plantation people to arm something like 40 uh, men. I mean, rifled, rifled arms. And he went back with uh, three uh, deputies with a warrant for the arrest of the two boys. He, he gets the two boys, he starts out and the, you know, the strike breaker said, well, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. And so they came out of the schoolhouse and that's when the massacre occurred. The shooting started. No one knows who fired the first shot, but when it was all over, you had 17 uh, Filipinos dead, four uh, policemen, and a lot wounded. So uh, but the, the importance of the massacre for everybody is to understand that we were a feudal society here. You had 
the rich oligarchs, no different than in Russia, you had the oligarchs who had complete control over the economy and the politics, and you had the servants who were close to being slaves. And that's, a, that's what Hawaii was like even during the time I grew up, okay? So it's important to understand what the massacre is all about. And you know, when you talk about land ownership, well, unfortunately, <laughs> our Hawaiian kings were very ignorant about land and they gave the haoles, I mean, the, you know, the plantation types, all the land that they wanted literally for free. So that when the, when the time came for people like my father to get a piece of property, he had to go beg. You know, it wasn't just $10,000. It's what he paid for it. It was, it was you got to tell me what you're going to do before we let the property go. Because they wanted to have, the, the, the oligarchs wanted to have control over every aspect of the economy. So anyway. You know, that's why I write these stories, so you understand that, and I'm not a revolutionary, I'm just <laughs> saying, well, you know, again, if you read, I don't know if anybody's ever read the story of the Cuban revolution, but there's an agricultural society that was controlled very much like the control that was exercised in Hawaii. Yeah. yeah, thanks, that's uh, very educational too. Um, yeah, you've uh, come a long way from shining shoes and selling cigarettes. Uh, to, <laughs> <laughs> to, you, you remember my stories about being a gopher boy for the yeah, soldiers, don't you? yeah, yeah, <laughs> to you know, to, to judge. And uh, about eight years ago, I guess you're president of uh, Kauai Historical Society. And you put on a great show at the Spitz at uh, Wailua. It was uh, some of the best uh, local musical talent. So mahalo for that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we are running out of time. Any uh, last words you want to say about uh, old Hawaii or Hawaii? Well, I, 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 n number one, I, I really believe that this is a great place to live in. It's a great place to live in because we are a lot freer than we were during the plantation era. You know, I, I have to respect uh, the leadership that's come into the islands from, I'll call, it, I'll call it the immigrants that came here to work in the plantations. That leadership has provided more and more freedom for all the people to live a better life. And that it, to me is the most important aspect of living on Kapa'a town comparing it to the past and what I know it's like now. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Judge uh, Bill Fernandez. Okay. Um, mahalo to our guest, Judge Bill Fernandez. Mahalo to our viewers on Think Tech Hawaii. If you like the Think Tech free media shows, please help support this non-profit platform with a donation. Aloha, ahui ho, malama bono. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.